This episode of the Old Dogs REI Network is brought to you by Mino Studio. In a world where jobs are how most people make money, one man, one desire, one challenge dares to break the mold. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where we don't work for money. Money works for us. Coming soon, viewer discretion advised. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where cash flow is king. Real estate investing, the means, so you can enjoy your retirement dreams. This is the show where we cut right to the chase. No sales pitch, no long monologues, just simple how-to real estate investing advice, so you can earn the passive income you need to enjoy your retirement today. And now, your host and chief old dog, Bill Manacero. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network. I'm your host, Bill Manacero, and this is the show where 50 plusers and anyone else who wants to join us get solid, no sales pitch, real estate investing advice to help generate real cash flow. This podcast airs twice weekly on Mondays and Fridays, and if you aren't already a subscriber, go to iTunes, type in Old Dog, spelled D A W G, find our podcast, and subscribe. Well, I am very stoked about today's show. This is really fun, and I'm excited here because I have like one of my favorite people in real estate here. This is a gentleman who has been on the show twice, but he just just you know he's just not another guest. Okay, this guy. Okay, was should I? Okay, let me let me just tell you who I'm talking about. I'm talking about Joe Fairless. <laughs> okay, and Joe is best known as the host of the world's longest running daily podcast ever on real estate okay it's called the best ever real estate advice ever <laughs> did i say ever too many times podcast okay but either There's way no such thing you yeah you just keep saying ever <laughs> throw it in there many times who cares okay it's, it's so complicated to say but it's great for google searches for seo purposes <laughs> <laughs> I, I figured you had some kind of marketing purpose in there but uh Joe as known also as the best ever first guest on the Old Dogs REI Network. That's right. He was on episode wow. 001, okay? Way back on May 17, 2016, our first episode. So that's right. And uh, this is a guy I, I've got a great deal of respect for, um, except this one piece of advice he told me I should start a podcast, okay? And I'll never forgive him for that. <laughs> no, no, just kidding. Actually, that turned out to be the best ever real estate-related advice I've ever had, okay, to date since becoming a real estate investor, Okay. Let me give you a little more background on Joe. He was the youngest VP of a New York advertising agency. He left the just the fast-paced, exciting world of advertising in 2012 to pursue real estate investing full-time. And at that time, he owned four single-family homes that produced monthly income. Now, I don't know if it was enough for him to live on at the time, but anyway, he did quit and he <laughs> did have those properties. Later, he decided to go exclusively into multifamily, and his very first deal was a 168-unit apartment of which he raised one million from private investors. This is his first deal. Okay, this is amazing. Well, he, he gets more amazing as we go on here. Joe now has control of more than $572 million worth of real estate. He has written three books, Real Estate Investing Advice Ever, Volumes 1 and 2, Best Ever Apartment Syndication Book. Um, his books have also been endorsed by Shark Tank star and real estate mogul Barbara Corcoran. Uh, besides investing and hosting a top podcast, he writes a blog, which includes nearly 1,400 informative posts, is an avid philanthropist. He coaches. He hosts the best ever real estate investing advice conference, okay, as one coming up in February 2020. 
And that's just the beginning, okay? <laughs> what he does. Some trivia on Joe, okay? Team captain of a championship flag football team. Uh, he performed stand-up comedy at Gotham Comedy Club in New York City. Now, that one I didn't know about until I actually <laughs> researched and saw that. <laughs> no, that is hilarious. I want to hear some jokes in this, okay, during this thing. So, all Which right. is why I don't tell people about it. So, <laughs> I, I, it, was, it was a short-lived stint. I did it once. It was in front of a very friendly audience of like half my coworkers and then a bunch <laughs> of other people who were there who – we're just drinking and so anything was funny and and it was it that i just did it i actually did it twice once at gotham comedy club and another at some place that shut down shortly thereafter because i was so terrible at it so oh, I, don't, is, I don't have much in this tank for jokes it's, it's, it reminds me of the finding nemo you know the part where they would always you know he's a clownfish the, the everybody would always ask him yeah say something funny you know <laughs> right like, yeah yeah yeah, yeah this one <laughs> like joke that. that they really started, their eyes just glassed over <laughs> it's, anyway <laughs> also he attended more third eye blind concerts than anyone you know okay Okay, and that's for those that who know who Third Eye Blind is. But <laughs> I'm sure they're like really just this great sort of like indie band type thing. Maybe I don't know. Okay, <laughs> I'm too old to know. They might be. Who knows? They might be the number one band in the country for all I know. But here's what I think he's the most famous thing for. Okay, and, and a lot of you may not know this, but Joe was the guy who invented the now infamous, and I emphasize infamous old dog closing howl yeah that's right joe was the guy who said hey shouldn't i howl or something <laughs> and that launched us into we've got howls from robert kiyosaki ken mackle I mean, I mean, we've got some of the greatest howls out there because of joe okay and it launched into the actual golden howl awards which we celebrate annually and give out you know precariously but anyway that is uh that is it joe welcome back to the old talks rei network we're pretty much ready i'm i'm <laughs> i'm most proud of the howl i i, I that out of all those things coming up with or, or i don't know if i came up with it i don't remember but i i, I do remember talking to you and be like hey when aren't i gonna actually howl right now and you're like howl away and and i just let it rip and i'm it was it, it felt good too it felt real good to howl oh. i think i think we saw howl at least once a day you know the, i i couldn't agree with you more in fact you know we might even put out like a little you know sort of a you know with music in the background you know like yeah. people can listen to and get their howl on you know kind of yeah new. that's good <laughs> start like your day that. off <laughs> Wow. Well, Joe, it is great having you back on, man. So great to hear your voice. And, uh, you know, you, you don't even sound tired. <laughs> no. Well, that's because I just drank a green drink that has kale, spinach, romaine, cucumber, celery, lemon, lime, and ginger in it. Oh, so I got all sorts that of energy. That sounds good. That sounds really good. Oh, man. Yeah, it yeah. was. All I had was a stale cup of coffee. What is going on? Oh, <laughs> I know. You know, I've just, uh, you know, it's all the time it takes to, like, cut all those things up, though, and put them in our, we have a juicer that's, like, you know, massive juicer that's, like, you know, state-of-the-art type thing, but it takes, like, a day, you know, to clean all the, the you know, the vegetables yeah. and cut them up and stuff, but uh, but it's worth it. It's worth it, man, definitely. And so you're sounding healthy and, and good, so I've got to get back and do that. Well, Joe, last time, or actually from the first time I interviewed you, okay, you were our first guest, as I mentioned. In three years, you had you had, uh, you had acquired up to $28 million in real estate at that time, okay? So here it is three years later, and it's like proportionally just totally out of line here with $570 million in real estate. I mean, this is like what are you doing? You know, it must be those drinks or something. <laughs> it's like, that is, that is unbelievable. You have grown tremendously since the last time I talked to you, even when 2017 you were on, we talked about sponsors and deals, a great show too. So man, it, tell me about what's going on. What, what have you been up to? Well, I'd say first thing I, I was listening to your introduction before you started introducing me and you mentioned um, to subscribe in iTunes, iTunes is going away, right? You know that, right? 
No, I didn't know that. Yeah, Apple funds plans to end iTunes, so you'll you'll uh, you'll need to send all these wonderful listeners to uh, probably their um, app on their phone uh, to subscribe because I'm not sure when iTunes is going away, but they announced it no at way. the end of May. So yeah. what's what's that yeah. going to do with the whole? I mean, that's like, isn't that that's kind of where everybody goes? I, oh, I don't know how many people go on their desktop into iTunes, but most people, from what I from what I've seen, access the podcast on their phone and uh, in their car, and and those that will all still remain there. It's just the actual iTunes wow. uh, I guess, software, yeah, that's that's going away. But yeah, I just want to let you know about that. Yeah. Uh, Besides wow. researching iTunes uh, news, uh, what else have I been up to? Uh, well, I mean, my main focus is uh, Secret the Living is Giving. I mean, I've got a vision board on my wall, and it's a quote by Tony Robbins. He said the Secret to Living is Giving. He did a TED Talk. Of, I don't know how long ago it was, but he did a TED Talk, and he mentioned that, and it always has is, is stuck with me since. A couple other quotes. Uh, Zig Ziglar, help everyone get what they want. You'll get everything you want. And uh, the secret to service to many leads to greatness. So those those are three quotes that I really um, live by and are ingrained in what I do. And, you know, anytime I'm about to jump on a conference call to talk about an opportunity with investors, I think about how investors need this opportunity because it's something that is uh, is so special and something that um, I'm I feel grateful to be able to offer them. Um, so I put my heart in the right place uh, and I I come at it with you know, pure intentions because I want to help them uh, achieve their financial goals. And I think when we have that type of mindset, then we are going to do better than not um, in business. And I was listening to a Jim Rohn this morning when I was working out and there's a pretty cool mix of Jim Rohn speeches and also like jazzy music. If you search in Spotify for anyone who uses Spotify, uh, Jim Rohn, J I M R O H N. I think that's how he spells his name. And just search that in Spotify and you'll get some playlists where some DJs have mixed Jim and also uh, some, some music. So you can listen to motivational stuff uh, and still, you know, get, get some upbeat music. Well, I was, I was listening to it today and he talked about how his mentor said, make a goal of being a millionaire and make the goal not for the money that you'll receive, but who it will make you become and then give away your million dollars. Uh, now I don't know if anyone's ever done that where you make your first million, then you immediately give it away to a nonprofit or something. Maybe people have, I'm actually, I'm sure some people have, but the point of it is have a monetary goal, but the monetary goal isn't to actually receive the money. It's to be the person who you need to be in order to accomplish that. And I think that's the key, and that's what I'm focused on. So, yeah, that's what I've been up to. Well, I'm, I'm focused on personal development. I'm focused on um, continuing to add value to our investors. And then the way that my company, my company is Ashcroft Capital, the way my company that I co-founded with my business partner, Frank, has been able to grow. And we closed on a couple deals last week, so we're at $610 million now is through the partnerships, um, you know, the, and, and identifying what each of us are really good at and what we're not good at. Because in order to be successful in any business uh, and real estate and apartment investing certainly is in this group, we have to know what do the best of the best do really well in our industry and then identify uh, by looking at ourselves in the mirror and saying, okay, the best of the best do this very well in our industry. So this, these are the skill sets that are required to be a top-notch performer in our industry. 
So knowing that these skill sets are required, which of these skill sets can I excel in? And which one, if I'm being honest with myself, or which ones, if I'm being honest with myself, is just not in my nature. Because uh, when I got started, I was trying to do it all, um, all, all the components of business by myself or with some vendors. And it just didn't set myself up or, or the business up for success, whereas now uh, Frank and I have complementary skill sets and we have a team that we've hired, full-time employees with an Ashcroft that we've hired who are a lot better at us in certain components of the business than we could be because, one, they bring the track record of being focused in those particular areas, and then, two, um, you know, they are more inclined just from a, a personality and just they're, they're, they're more interested in certain things um, than us. So I think those are, those are some things I've been focused on, and, and that's uh, the way I approach the business for how we've been able to scale. That's great. Now, maybe can you zero in on some of those, uh, those sure. skill sets that you're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so there, um, there are three main things we need to do in order to uh, have a successful business in apartment investing. Uh, one, we need money. Two, we need a deal. And three, we need to execute. Because we can be anyone can be a spreadsheet millionaire. Not too hard to put numbers in a spreadsheet and make it look good, and then add some zeros and wham, there, there we go. We got a great project, but it's in the execution. The the money's in execution. Uh, before before we can execute, we got to have a deal, and then um, before we can close, we need to make sure we have money. So those three components: money, deal, execution, are how we think about our business. Uh, so we. Uh, we all focus on certain areas. So my focus is on the money part, making sure we've got the money for uh, that we need to close on the deals, as well as ongoing investor relationships and reporting to investors on a monthly basis. We send monthly updates to our investors by the 14th of every month. The premiums we're getting relative to what we projected, the CapEx projects we're working on, any market news that's relevant, community engagement that we're doing um, you know, like a Valentine's Day party or something. And then every quarter we provide the detailed financials, P&L statement, as well as the rent roll. So uh, my focus is on uh, the money part and making sure we're building long-term relationships with investors. And then Frank's focus is uh, overseeing the deal and execution part. And there's overlap, certainly, on all three categories, but uh, we have full-time employees a uh, director of acquisition, Scott Lebenhart, and um, a director of asset management, Alec Regino. Uh, Scott focuses on broker relationships and, and traveling to markets that we're focused on and getting the deals. And then overseeing a team of underwriters that we have full time who are locked in a basement somewhere right now with no windows running numbers on deals. <laughs> and then we've got Alec who is focused on asset management and both Alec and Scott, they have years of experience in the industry working for groups larger than ours. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're uh, hiring up versus hiring down in the process. And um, so we're investing in, in the business through the people. And so uh, we've got those three components, the money, the deal and execution. And, uh, We've got people overseeing those areas who are naturally inclined to be interested in those areas. And um, so that sets us up for success. And the challenge that a lot of people have whenever they're starting out is, well, okay, I don't have the money to pay for full-time employees to focus on that. Or I've got access to money, but I can't find any deals. Well, okay, it's not a unique challenge. How have others come across that scenario and overcome it and, and got some solutions. And so there's, uh, there's many different ways to um, grow the business, get into deals, focus on what you want to focus on and then bring in the right partners. Cause it might not be employees. It might be joint venture partners. 
It could be um, vendors who are strictly third-party vendors, or it could be vendors who have some upside in the deal. Uh, from you know, like property management, you could you could hire them as a third-party company. Uh, one, you could bring them in on your deal, and they could um, get some equity in the deal, and then they have some upside. Uh, or you could um, bring them. You you could. Uh, negotiate a lower fee. Let's say their fee is 4% of the collected uh, income. Say their fee is 4%. Well, you could negotiate a 3% fee um, over the course of the ownership, but give them a, a bonus for when they achieve a certain uh, NOI upon a refinance. And whatever that bonus is, you could simply say, okay, um, normally you get 4%, but um, let's do 3%. And the difference between three and four percent is X, Y, Z, whatever that amount is. Let's say it's a hundred thousand dollars over the lifetime of the project. Um, so what I'd like to what I'd like to do is we'll give you a bonus of one hundred and fifty thousand dollars when you achieve an NOI of X, Y, Z on a refinance, or when we sell a property if we achieve this certain purchase price. That way, the property management company participates on the upside as well. Well not being an equity owner, so you cap what you're what you're actually paying them. So they're coming out ahead, assuming that they perform how they know they can perform. And then you're coming out ahead because during the lifetime of the project, you've paid less. So that helps with your expenses. But then when there's profit to be made, you share some of that with the property management company. So it's really just identifying based on what your unique skill set is, where you fit within the puzzle, and then putting the right pieces around you and making sure there's alignment of interest as well as people are all focused on what they're especially talented at. That's great. That uh, You've heard of the book uh, Rocket Fuel? Um, I, I have heard of it. Yep. Yeah. I have not read it. It's it's great book. It's it's a lot a lot along lines. I think of what you were talking about. A little bit you know a little bit different, uh, but it, it you know it looks at you know f- companies that have just just excelled and and it, uh, there always seems to be this partnership you know, that's you know like Microsoft, Bill Gates, and Paul Allen or Apple, Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak. You know you have the uh, what they call a visionary, and then they have the other person is is really like the you know the operator the 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 operations person you know that they can put the the technical stuff together and um and it sounds like a similar type of relationship you have with your partner you know um i see you more sort of on that visionary side even though you know you have tasks that you do that pertain to other specific areas that need to be done um you're the kind of the upfront guy and the the one that's getting the visibility and the you know identity um i, I don't know if that is do you see that happening in your case uh, I think the the visions equal in our case um, because we think about we just think differently on some things based on our background. I mean, my background, my my major was advertising, and I was an English major. His major was um, engineering. I think electrical. I need to look that up because I, I I talk about him enough where I need to remember exactly what he majored in, but it's, I know it's sometimes engineering. So he's an engineer at heart Mm -hmm. and he, he thinks, I mean, he built our underwriting model from scratch and it's just um, a robust um, piece of art that he, that he created (laughs) in Excel. I, it is an Excel spreadsheet, but that would not do it justice to call it an Excel spreadsheet. Like it's, it's a powerful machine that, that he created. Uh, He's a spreadsheet wizard. So, and I am not, although I can work, I work my way around it, but it's just a different level that he's at. So we think of different things in terms of where we're headed, um, but then we are able to uh, communicate along the way um, very well with each other. And that's one key to partnerships, to know what type of communication do you prefer, what style, the frequency, and make sure that the other person's on board. Uh, and um, is aligned with that because uh, when, if, especially if you are working in, in different areas like uh, we are, I'm based in Cincinnati, my wife's from here, so we live here, and our, our headquarters, the company headquarters is in New York City, and that's where Frank works, and that's where our, most of our team is. 
So we don't see each other on a daily basis, but we talk multiple times a day and, and the communication style that we both have, it fits really well with each other. Oh, that's neat. Yeah. And, and that's, and, and it sounds like you, you've really worked that out. I mean, since, since day one or very early on, um, you know, at least as long as I've known you, you've been working with Frank and, uh, um, and it's, you know, it's one of those areas, you know, too, you know, I ask people, uh, one of the questions I ask people is, you know, biggest, what's your biggest mistake, biggest success. And, and unfortunately, you know, a number of people will say, you know, it's, it was a bad partnership. That was a mistake, you know, um, because it's, it, it's not everybody can find that right person, you know, that, that you can really gel with. Um, and, and there's other issues there too. Maybe they just wasn't the vetting and a lot of other things that you would want to do and before you launch into a partnership. But, uh, that's, it's great to hear when you've got the success stories like, uh, like you do in that, in that area. Kind of curious too. I mean, you have, this is, you know, kind of the, what I would call the billion dollar best ever question, okay, of the interview today. And I'm asking it a little early here for you, but okay. So how do you manage all your properties, mentor and coach, organize conferences, write blog content, do your YouTube channel, do a seven day a week daily podcast, write books and do philanthropic work? And still remain married. No, that's <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just get a tough time here. So yeah, team members and integration. So let's talk about the remain married part. <laughs> Pauline and I just celebrated our two-year marriage anniversary yesterday. Congratulations. And, you know, we've been together four years total. I think of it as you know, and got a how beautiful little together. daughter, too. You can't forget her. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So we see each other constantly and we're always around each other. Uh, and I'm very fortunate to have a business uh, where we're all able to kind of hang out throughout the day. And, you know, they, I'm, I'm with them and they're with me. And um, so there's a lot of integration uh, with stuff, but uh, the, more more to the point of how is all this stuff able to be done well i'm not a one man show i with the i mean the, the number one priority is performing on our current portfolio for investors number one priority that's it and we have a team in place along with me to um oversee that process and uh, so that's number one priority uh, then all that stuff you mentioned, you know, blog posts, books, podcasts, seven days a week, um, YouTube channel. Well, I've got a full-time social media person. I don't touch the YouTube channel. He does it all. Um, we've got the podcast. Well, it is a seven day a week podcast, but two days out of the week, Theo, uh, who is a full-time employee of mine, he does something called syndication school where we, where he talks about syndicate uh, apartment syndication lessons from our book and he teaches people how to do apartment syndication. So that's, so that's two days out of the seven. And then um, the remaining five days, uh, I am now six months ahead in interviews uh, with the podcast. So I do all my interviews on one day and that is Thursday. And I interview nine people on Thursday and then I'm booked out for nine days as a result of that. Well, I've been doing that for a while where I'm constantly getting more days than what, you know, the days of the week there are. And so when I interview this next Thursday, all my nine guests, they're going to air those episodes are going to air six months from now. So we're so far out. I could choose not to do it for six months and the podcast would still run every single day. And so that gives me flexibility to do whatever I need to do. Should some, something unexpected take place, or I'll ask Theo to do those interviews. You mentioned the blog, Theo and I collaborate on the blog post. I put the outline together. I give ideas. He writes the content uh, and then I review it and I update it. Uh, you talk about the books, same thing. Um, so, you know, it's just, it's just team members. That's it. I mean, I'm, I'm it, the, I've structured the company and the business so that 
it's not reliant on me, but I ideally enhance the operations by being a part of it. Man, that's, that's a, it's still, it's a lot of plates to, to, you know, to spin, you know, to keep spinning. Uh, even though, you know, you're not doing everything. It's, uh, you know, one of the things too, I was really curious about, do you ever run out of guests? You know, is there ever a point where you're kind of like, you know, you've got somebody saying, okay, look, we've got, you know, the guy that details Robert Kiyosaki's car. He wants to be on the show. <laughs> no, I mean, that's a, that's a lot of shows. And, and I'm always like, you know, conscious of, hey, I gotta get, you know, it's gotta be a good guest. It's gotta be, you know, I mean, that's gotta, mm-hmm. that, that, I mean, I know you're not necessarily handling that, but. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not handling that, but I'd say um, it's something that, uh, Jordan Peterson said uh, that I happened to catch one of his videos and it resonated with me. And that is we can learn something from everyone that we come across in life. And if we don't learn something from that person, it's not on them. It's on us. So it's, it's our responsibility to ask the right questions. It's our responsibility to get the information from them through the the conversation and if we don't that's not their fault it's just how we approach the conversation so it's it's less important for me to pick the right guests it's more important for me to pick the right questions during the conversation because i have a firm belief that i can learn something from anyone yeah, that's a that's great i agree with you on that one totally totally wow Wow, this is uh, really uh, exciting. Just uh, you know, just having you on and hearing just all, all the great stuff that's happening. Uh, do you do you go to New York often? Uh, do you ever interface with those folks there, or is it all by phone and and just you know, sort of conference calls that kind of thing? Yeah, well, I have a seven month old first, first kiddo, and uh, I have not so been. Great. Yeah, we haven't been traveling as much as a result of. Uh, pregnancy and kiddos and stuff or kiddo uh, singular and stuff so well, something you're not telling us um, that we should know about kiddos did you say oh no no no, no. <laughs> one okay. for sure one okay. um so you know uh, i i don't travel to new york very very often um but we meet a lot of times at the properties so there's not a whole there's not really a reason for me to be in New York city at the office. It's more relevant for me to meet up with team members at the properties that we own or that we're looking to purchase. And so that's when I see most of the team. Gotcha. So you're, you're, you're going to every uh, property purchase or at least going to see you know, at the inspection or at least uh, to check out the properties. Yeah. I want to respect your time here and uh, don't want to don't want to run too long here. But, uh, uh, you know, I did want to ask you, you know, we've we've got our, our folks are 50 plus in age there. Uh, many of them are, are working sort of toward retirement. They're getting ready. Um, there are those that are already in retirement and there, there's sort of a, a range of different places that people are coming from. Some folks are, you know, they, maybe they got their nest egg and they're ready, you know, to retire and, you know, putting it together, kind of last finishing touches. And so, and they're really concerned about, you know, will that sustain them through their, you know, through their entire lifetime? And if so, you know, will they have to compromise the, you know, their lifestyle today to, to do that? And then there's others that are saying, gee, I don't have enough for my retirement. I'm going to need to fill the gap there. And, uh, you know, I'm going to need that additional cash flow. And, and there are those that are saying, Hey, you know, I just, I'd like to be able to leave a legacy to my kids. I just don't want to eat up all the money. And then my kids are left with nothing. I want to be able to leave them something. So there's, there's a lot, sort of a lot of different needs that are, uh, that are the focus of this audience. But, uh, you know, I wanted to, sort of ask you for your sort of your, I mean, you are the guy of the best ever advice here regarding real estate investing. So what would be your advice for those folks um, in terms of, you know, looking at real estate investing as a means for them to be able to fulfill those goals? I think I was on a call today with someone and they had um, uh, about a dozen properties about uh, worth around, I'll call it one and a half million, all owned free and clear. Uh, cash flow is around 5,000 a month. And 
they were asking me, you know, just my thoughts on that and um, because they wanted to do something with it because there was a lot of equity trapped in those deals. And my thoughts during that conversation are the same thoughts based on your question. And that is the way to generate the significant income while still being conservative uh, is in real estate is to buy cash flowing properties that have value add components to them. And so my suggestion is to invest in deals, find operators. If you're not wanting to do it on your own and hire your own management company, find operators where you can uh, per- invest into cash flowing properties that make money day one and then have a business plan to increase the value. And by doing that, you're getting the best of both worlds. You're getting the cash flow that is, uh, you know, that comes with real estate investing, at least comes with investing in the right properties, but you're also getting the upside potential of the forced from the forced appreciation through renovating the interiors, increasing the rent, um, you know, adding amenities, whatever, whatever the business plan is. And that's something I didn't recognize when I was starting out. I, I bought properties, um, my single family homes, I bought them and I didn't have a value add business plan. I just, um, you know, just bought the homes and they cash flowed and you know, it was great. Uh, I was fortunate that I bought them at the time, the single family homes that I bought when I started out and they were relatively low uh, price point um, and they've appreciated greatly. So now I can, now I can get that equity and, and roll that into some of our apartment deals that are value add deals. Um, but if I had known what I know now, when I was starting out built and I still was buying single family homes, I would have bought more value add deals where we could force appreciation, buy or low force appreciation through something and then um, increase the value that way. Uh, that way you're not crossing your fingers and hoping that the market continues to appreciate and you benefit from it. It's icing on the cake when that happens, but if you have a specific business plan for how to force appreciation through some tried and true method and the property currently cash flows day one, then you're mitigating the risk while you know, benefiting from potential upside. Mm, great, great advice. That's so true. And, and I think that that's, you know, that's one of the things that's so appealing about multifamily is that you can, I mean, I guess you could do value add with single family homes, but it's, it's not going to do anything exponentially as compared to a, a multifamily. I mean, where you can just, you could, you know, double the value of a, of a property in essence, you know, if you did the right kind of uh, deal um, on the value ends ad side, I'm sure you've seen that with some of the projects you guys have done. Yep. Thank you. That's great, great advice. Before we, we close, I, I did, I did want you just to address a little bit. One of the things that I, I think is very impressive about what you do is your, your commitment to giving back. And I thought if you could just kind of just let us know some of the things I, you know, I knew back way back when you were doing, you know, Texas tech and junior achievement and so forth. But, uh, um, I I know you've got this thing that's at least is new to me is this sort of like giving back through advertising scholarships and, uh, um, and maybe it could, you know, some of the other causes that you're involved in, uh, maybe you could just kind of just give us sort of a little idea of what, what some of those things are. Yeah. I, I do it in a more formalized method now. Uh, so besteverpauses.com is an initiative that we've been doing. Um, when I say we, it's my wife and I have been doing for, I don't know, maybe a year, maybe a little bit longer. I'm not exactly sure. But every month we highlight a new nonprofit and we donate money uh, as well as give that nonprofit exposure. So I'm um, uh, you go to besteverpauses.com. You can see all the nonprofits that we've highlighted. Kids Cancer Alliance looks like this month. St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Uh, Branches, uh, which is uh, provides life-changing opportunities for working families to help them and their children break the cycle of generational poverty. We we And we get the causes from people who submit causes that they'd like for us to highlight, and we review them. Uh, so looks like we got 
four, eight, 12, six, about 16 or so causes. So we've been there about a year and a half. Uh, and then, yeah, that's, that's um, kind of easy stuff that I do uh, because it's, I mean, quite frankly, it's highlighting it on our website, social media, and it's money. But uh, so I, I don't want to uh, downplay best ever causes because it's an important part. But for me personally, I also volunteer for hospice. Uh, that is eye-opening. Actually working in a hospice? Uh, yes. Um, wow. That's awesome. Visiting visiting patients. Yeah, I've been doing that for about a year. So uh, approximately twice a month, I'll, I will visit with a patient. Um, and I've been doing that for about maybe two years or so. And um, that is most impactful for me personally, um, just for for many many reasons. Um, and yeah, I'm I'm involved in other things like junior achievement. But I mean, quite frankly, I'm just I'm on the board. You know, I I, I don't think I really add a lot of value. Uh, I just sit in a monthly meeting and listen to stats and stuff. But I do volunteer with within that. Um, when I teach a class with junior achievement, then again, I can see the real cause and effect of my time and, you know, smiles and light bulbs going off in their heads and stuff, which is pretty cool. So I, I think it, for me personally, you know, everyone gives back differently and there's no right or wrong. But for me personally, it's my more hands-on stuff that I do, uh, teaching in classes um, or volunteering for hospice, um, but then also myself and my wife, we do best ever causes um, so that we can scale this more because I only have certain hours of the, the week I, or, or month I can dedicate towards, you know, personally doing stuff. And otherwise I really got to scale this thing. Um, so that, that's, those are some of the initiatives. You mentioned the, the scholarships. Yeah. I've been doing that for like seven years, um, awarding a scholarship to a Texas tech student to go to New York city and shadow uh, some some employers with the hope of them eventually moving to New York City after they graduate, because I believe that will jumpstart their career more so than if they stay in Lubbock or go to a smaller market. Oh, that's neat. Do you ever any of those uh, kids you tap into kids or young young people? Do they ever so, you know get involved with you guys doing your social media or anything like that so that they can get experience or? No, no, they're most. I haven't, I haven't, um, noticed any of them being interested in real estate. <laughs> they're, they're all, uh, you know, focused on advertising agencies, promotion agencies, and gotcha. you know, they're, they're just trying to figure things out. Oh, neat, neat, neat stuff. I, I think that that's, uh, you know, not only admirable, but I think it's, it's required of us. I really do. I think is, you know, yep. we're, we're blessed we should bless others. And I, and it's neat to need to hear some of the great stuff you're doing, man. That's, that's awesome. Well, Joe, this has been so great having you back and uh, just just to catch up here and uh, hear all the latest stuff. And you got a new member of your family, pretty exciting stuff, and uh, um, some just some neat things happening in in your world. And uh, you know, the conferences I, th- those those look like they're. I've heard such great things from people that have gone. Just really, really good, uh, neat neat things going on there. So uh, you we, should come. You know, I'd love to, you know, it's a little closer to home maybe, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I know you probably picked like the center of the, the U S just so it makes it easier for folks to get there. It's like Colorado or, um, yeah, it's in Denver. Yeah. Yep. BEC, you go to besteverconference.com and you can see all the details of it. Ah, that's great. And how, how can folks find out more about what you're doing and, and some of the, the deals, some of your, your coaching, different things. What's the best, uh, best way for folks to, to reach you? If you're looking to potentially partner on deals and you're a credited investor, then you can go to invest with Ashcroft.com invest with a S H C R O F T.com. Uh, if you're, just looking to learn more about apartment syndication, then um, you go to uh, besteverpassiveinvestor.com. That, that's a resources guide that we put together that would be very helpful. Or if you're active and you want to learn more about doing deals, you can go to apartmentsyndication.com and a bunch of content there for if you are uh, wanting to be put together deals yourself and a bunch of good resources for you. 
all free. Great, great. Man, I love it. Well, uh, you know, we have this tradition here, Joe, as we close out our show, <laughs> Joe, um, that, uh, you know, this guy came up with about, you know, just closing with your best old hound dog howl. And I'm um, wondering if you, you know, <laughs> you wouldn't mind. Who came uh, up with that idea? I don't know, man. I don't know. The same guy got me into <laughs> podcasting. But anyway, I'm not going to hold it against <laughs> So are you ready? You think you can do as good I'm as you ready. did on the first show? You had your, your green juice. You I have my green drink. Yeah, got you're my re- green juice. Ready to go, man. So let's uh, let's give it a try. Let's see how it goes. Sounded great. It sounded like somebody that just fell off Thank the edge you. of the Grand Canyon, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have my 13 pound Yorkie come up here and want to join me if I keep doing that. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Well, Joe, thanks so much for for coming on. Really appreciate it. All right. Enjoyed it. Talk to you you again later. Thanks, everyone. Okay, you bet. Also, I want to thank all our old dog listeners out there, too, for joining us. I know there's a lot of other things you could be doing right now, but the fact that you've taken the time to join us means a lot, and we greatly appreciate it. Please note, everything we talked about today it, it is accessible in our show notes, links, and all the other stuff that uh, Joe presented here uh, can be found in our show notes at olddogsreinetwork.com forward slash blog. And just look for the episode with Joe Fairless. Well, that's the show for today. Remember, cash flow is king, real estate investing the means. Until next time, keep moving forward and may God bless. Thank you very much for visiting the Old Dogs REI Network. We would greatly appreciate if you would stop by iTunes and let us know what you think of the show. We would love if you could subscribe to the podcast, give us a five-star rating, and write a review. The more ratings and reviews we receive, the more visible the podcast will be to others. Thank you.